Hello, my name is Roisin and welcome or welcome back to my channel. So I'm kind of dressed up today um, because I am about to go to my friend's wedding um, but I have tried to film this video three times over the past week and it hasn't worked so we are trying it now. So it is August which means that summer is kind of coming to a close or at least here in the UK it hasn't been making up its mind at the moment but I know that some of you may have annual leave coming up or even holidays that you are going on and for some people that means it is time to crack out the big books. The books that are over 500 pages because you finally have time to devote to them. Also, as I said, autumn is just around the corner and I know some people prefer to cozy up in the autumn time with their big books. So hopefully this video is right at the perfect time for you, whether you are a summer holiday big book reader or a cozy autumn big book reader. I, I have 10 big books that I love. As I mentioned, all of these are over 500 pages long. So there is a lot to sink your teeth into. With a lot of these, I listen to them on audiobook, which I think can be a great way to get through your big books. Because, you one, you cannot actually physically see how big they are, which makes them slightly less intimidating, even if the audiobook says 25 hours or whatever. Two, they are only the size of your device, so they are not so heavy, bad on your wrists if, like me, you have arthritis. And three, I think it's always nice to have someone tell you a story. I know some people struggle with uh, fiction audiobooks, but storytelling is as old as human beings, so I think being told a story is a lovely way to read books. So let's get into the 10 big books that I absolutely love and think that you will enjoy this summer or autumn. I'm going to start with the shortest book and work my way up to the longest. So the shortest book on my list is 528 pages and this is The Game of Kings by Dorothy Dunnett. This is a piece of historical fiction set in the 16th century in Scotland at the time when Mary Queen of Scots is a tiny baby and the English are trying to marry her to Edward VI. It talks about Lyman who is one of the lords of Scotland but he has been uh, kind of banished from the country because they think that he betrayed them to the English. We don't know if this is true but Lyman has returned at the start of the novel and he is causing a commotion besieging castles, stealing from lords, and generally making a ruckus with his band of merry ruffians. We follow multiple perspectives during this story, but we do follow Lyman and the people close to him as well. And so we see that whilst he may be doing things that are not exactly legal, he does have a certain morality that plays throughout. He's kind of a Jack Sparrow-ish character, I would say. Definitely, it's a swashbuckling adventure. I think this book is a great fun romp if that is something you are looking for in your big books. Uh, it is an excellent adventure but there is also a mystery at the heart of it. We don't know what Lyman did, we don't know who is betraying the English at the moment and we don't know if Lyman can really be trusted. So there is that mystery pulling you through as well as all of the um, little kind of heist-like adventure moments that continue throughout. The characters are also really strong. Lyman is a poetry quoting romantic swashbuckling hero uh, and the female characters are also really strong. Um, the character of his mother, of Christian Stewart, of uh, various other female characters are painted with a lot of depth, uh, which I always love in uh, female characters. They are not just trophies to be won, there is a lot more to them, which I think makes this the perfect historical fiction romp if that is your genre. The second book on my list is contemporary literary fiction and this is White Teeth by Zadie Smith which is 560 pages long. This is kind of a family saga although it only follows uh, two generations of a family. We have two fathers who fought together in World War II, one of whom is Indian Bangladeshi and one of whom is a white British man and they were in the same tank. We follow them uh, through the 70s and up until the year 2000, I believe is where it ends. As they have, uh, as they grow and have families, uh, the uh, Bangladeshi man is in an arranged marriage and his children we follow and the uh, white British man marries a Jamaican woman whose mother is a Jehovah's Witness and their children go to school with a white liberal middle class family and we see all of the interactions between these three families. Uh, this is very much a book of place. It's very focused in North London and so if you are from there or you are interested in London I think that this writing could really work for you. It's very very much sit situated in the place and the culture of um, multicultural working class North London. It also has a lot of humour. Um, it's particularly it's quite satirical about characters, about their lack of understandings of themselves and each other, um, their prejudices and their fixed ideas and how those rub up against one another. It also talks about our issues of race and gender and also of science versus um, religion. The man has two twin sons and one becomes a very religious uh, Muslim boy and so we follow his religion but also his brother becomes 
involved in science so we see the clash of those two things and we also see kind of eugenics and how the actions of your past come back to haunt you so it's definitely got a lot for you to sink your teeth into but i think that the comedy of it and the endearingness of all of these terribly flawed characters can help pull you through even though it is a really long book Another book that is 560 pages long is North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This has been described as Pride and Prejudice for Socialists and I think that is mostly because we do have two characters, uh, we do have a love story kind of at the centre of this book with two characters who do not at all get along at the beginning of the book or at least exactly about a third of the way through the book. North and South tells the story of a girl from a, who is the son of a vicar in a small town on the south coast of England who has to, who has been living in London with a friend and has to move back to her home um, when her friend gets married and then her father denounces the beliefs of the Church of England and so has to leave his parish and ends up moving to Milltown in the north of England which is based on Manchester. There he becomes the tutor for and friends with one of the major mill owners and that is where we have our love story between this daughter and this mill owner. They do not at all get on because of a misunderstanding understanding and because of their different backgrounds. Mentions a little bit the poverty of rural England and um, compares this with the working class poverty of the mill towns and the treatment of workers in the mill towns. Our main character befriends a family of mill workers and finds out about uh, the, father, the daughter's ill health because of the conditions of the mill and also about the rising labour movement. Um, whilst also it explores the so it explores both the parlour manners between these two families and um, the class differences between a genteel vicar's daughter and a man who's made his money from trade um, but it also talks about uh, working class people and the rise of the labour movement um, which is a really interesting perspective to have in a Victorian novel. Another big epic that actually does remind me quite a lot of White Teeth by Zadie Smith is The Old Drift by Namwali Sapal which is 576 pages long. This is a book of Zambian fiction that follows a hundred years of Zambian history and then on into the future. It is a combination historical fiction um, that deals that talks about the colonialism in Zambia it also talks about the um, fight for independence and the growing uh, left-wing movements in the country and then and the caste system in Zambia between the various different uh, ethnic backgrounds there are people of Indian heritage there are mixed race people as well as black and white people and the difference um, of power levels and of uh, social and class status in the country it talks about the use of Zambia as a testing ground for certain drugs and it talks into the future um, a sort of afrofuturism techno-futurism um, near future where, uh, where there is almost a brave new world aspect of technology although it is very very much closer to our current time than Brave New World is but it's that kind of people wanting technology without really considering what that the impact of that on them. There's another book that follows three families so we start off with three men in Zambia in 1904 and an incident that occurs between the three of them that connects their families and then they disperse back over the world um, and then their families slowly make their way back together following the grandmothers, the mothers and the children and when it is the children those three families finally connect back together again. We follow lots of different perspectives throughout this novel and all of the characters are so well balanced. None of these characters are saints or, or heroes but they are all very realistic and believable. There is also again a lot of humour. Um, we are all of these characters are endearing in their faults and their foibles and it manages to talk about a lot of different um, themes like I mentioned uh, through the use of conversation between characters and there are a lot of scenes that are just discussions between characters, different political ideas, um, and no one is ever framed as being right or wrong. Despite the length, again, the humour and the strength of these characters make it so very engaging. And there is also a Greek chorus throughout that talks to you and makes you question the validity of each of the narrative perspectives. The only non-fiction on this list is also 576 pages long, and that is This Changes Everything by Naomi Klein. This is a piece of non-fiction about capitalism and the climate um, and the way that the free market system has damaged our climate and is the reason that we are struggling to make any changes to uh, prevent climate change from happening. What I really love about Naomi Klein is that although this is a really chunky book with a lot of technical detail in it, she manages to mer merge together technical jargonistic um, detail with stories, human stories, which make it a lot easier to connect with if you are a layperson such as myself. Her 
Uh, she really gets to the human heart of these stories and makes it more accessible in that way. Uh, but she doesn't lack any rigour through that. She is a very incisive, rigorous journalist. Um, but I think the fact that she is a journalist, not a scientist, is what helps her to be a better science communicator in a way because, um, because she really understands the way that her reader may not grasp the science quite as well as the scientists talking about it. Um, she has a really strong argument about, uh, she has a really strong argument behind all of her points. Um, they, they are really well backed up, well researched um, and there's a lot of information but she doesn't just stop there, she also uh, gives advice and gives ideas and ways to move forward, um, ideas about activism and about, and about moving forward that I think really make it uh, a more positive experience than a like existential dread experience although she does like allow us to understand the existential dread she's also very um culturally aware she um interviews and spends time with different indigenous cultures talking about their understanding of the land she is canadian and so she talks to a lot of canadian first nations people but as well as pacific uh, also pacific island nations and things um and she's very culturally aware and understanding of that she's not coming in and being like we know best um in any way so i think that She's a really powerful communicator and that if you want to read some climate change non-fiction then Naomi Klein is a really great place to start. I know she has a lot of other books like No It Is Not Enough. Uh, this Changes Everything is the only one that I have personally read and I do think it is very much worth reading. Another play family saga over a long period of history um, is The Poisonwood Bible by Barbara Kingsolver. This tells the story of a missionary and his wife to the Belgian Congo, which is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in the 1960s. Um, and they have four daughters who they are with um, and we follow their experience of trying to set up a mission in this small town, this small village, um, and trying to convert people to Christianity and also trying to live and survive in this place that they know nothing about. Um, it really talks about the uh, damage that missionaries did in Africa um, and the the violent nature of going into a country believing that you know best. Um, and it also follows this family through the 60s and 70s and the Congo's fight for independence. Uh, it is told from the perspective of each of the four different daughters and also the mother and things, perspectives and points of view recur. I think the writing in this book is some of the most beautiful that I've ever read. It's really stunningly beautifully written. There is one passage where these ants arrive one day a year I believe uh, and they like a biting fire ants. I'm not, I wouldn't say they are actually fire ants but they are biting people and they all have to run to the river um, and the, the, the missionary family don't know anything about this and then they're all suddenly running to the river um, and the description of the ants biting them and the, the movement through it is so wonderfully evoked. This is another book with uh, a lot of different characters who are well drawn and although there definitely are some villains in this book um, there is also a lot of nuance and understanding of the position of women in a really strict Christian perspective like the family have so the position of the wife in relation to her husband but also about uh, colonialism and um, using Christianity to colonise countries. It is a really complex book with a lot in it, which I guess is why it is so long, um, but I really, really enjoyed it. And again, thought the writing was absolutely stunning. <laughs> Apparently my long books are all epics that follow large periods of history because another one that, from multiple perspectives, because another one that I would recommend is A Brief History of Seven Killings by Marlon James. And this one is 704 pages long. Marlon James is a Jamaican writer and this book is set in, mostly in Jamaica in the 1970s, but it also follows into Florida and into New York through the 80s. Uh, I think it goes from the 60s to the 90s actually, I think it follows, uh, follows a great big span of um, time. Now I would say that the time title is a bit of a misnomer because it's definitely not seven killings. There are a lot, lot more killings in this book. It is a book with a lot of violence because it is about gang culture in the 1970s uh, in Jamaica and how this was influenced by the CIA um, in order to crack down on left-wing people being elected in Jamaica um, and also to promote the drug war on drugs in New York um, through Reagan's policies on drugs. Uh, so there's a lot of complicated things going on, a lot of moving parts, um, but we mostly follow four perspectives as the time goes on throughout Jamaica. And one of these perspectives, maybe it's five perspectives, and one of these perspectives is a ghost of someone who was killed right at the beginning of the novel. Um, and we follow him as a ghost kind of walking through this world and seeing things. He's kind of our omniscient narrator um, because he can, you know, walk through walls and watch whatever he wants. It begins uh, with a plan to try to assassinate Bob Marley um, because he is stirring up left-wing political ideology in the country. Um, the way that the CIA infiltrates the gangs, but also the violence are based on colonialism, 
based on uh, the former enslavement of all of the people in Jamaica and the Maroon rebellions. There are mentions of those things and the legacy of colonialism in Jamaica, um, as well as the current neo-colonialism that happens there. We also move through the drug trade and the gang warfare into Florida and into New York where that continues and we see the way that people are trapped in their situation, the way that um, poverty conspires to keep you poor and criminality conspires to keep you criminal. It explores ideas of sexuality and gender and the homophobic and misogynistic culture of uh, Jamaica particularly within these gangs um, and it is one that is written in patois so that if you're not familiar with Jamaican patois it can take some time to get into much like train spotting or clockwork orange this book is really harsh and really difficult to read because there are a lot of terrible difficult things that happen um, so I would look up trigger warnings if that's something that you uh, need to do because we start from the very beginning there is violence and sexual violence but it's definitely a book that I think is worth reading for the uh, the really well-built historical atmosphere and from the beautiful if dark writing. Now a piece of historical fiction set in New Zealand that is 848 pages long and that is The Luminaries by Eleanor Catton. This book is famous for being based around the zodiac and having 12 main characters who each represent the zodiac signs and then several other main characters who are the sun, the moon, uh, various planets I believe and it is structured in a way that it like waxes and wanes like the full moon so the chapters get longer and longer and then shorter and shorter again. If you know nothing about the zodiac that doesn't matter. I knew very little about the Zodiac going in um, and it didn't really have any effect on how I enjoyed the story, although the themes of uh, fate and determinism that are a big part of this story, I think, uh, work well with that structure. It is set in New Zealand in Hokitika during the gold rush and there has been a man who has disappeared and a uh, woman who is a sex worker who has turned up um, unconscious and her with a dress full of gold. Um, so we know that there is a mystery going on. At the beginning Walter Moody who is our main narrator comes into a room and discovers 12 men standing around who go silent on his appearance and they begin to tell him a story passing it back and forth between them. Uh, so we shift in and out of different people's perspectives and there are a lot of different voices that come to the fore over the course of the novel. I think that the skill of Catton in making sure each of the voices are distinct is really really well done considering how many voices there are. Everyone seems um, entirely different from one another enough that you are aware each time of which perspective you are in. She also works with secrets and with mystery really well so it sort of builds towards what is the secret and then goes forward in time after that but the way that she slowly peels back the layers of the mystery is really well done and each time something is revealed more questions pop up. I think it is really a beautiful novel really and one of those novels that really would bear rereading I think because there is so much in it. Despite being 800 pages long it also manages to build tension. And the setting is also brilliant, uh, brilliantly rendered, uh, the feeling of the, the historical setting and also the physical setting. Then ideas of colonialism, of ownership and of um, prejudice come up again and again throughout the novel because we have characters who are we have a Maori character we have characters who are Chinese and we have a sex worker so the perception is a big part of the novel the way that characters see themselves and the way that they see each other which is so brilliantly done through the different multiple perspectives. Now a novel that is a third in a trilogy but I couldn't make this video without mentioning it and all of the books are fairly chunky. Uh, if you read all three of them you would be reading more than 2,000 pages so I think that it counts. And um, This is The Mirror and the Light by Hilary Mantel which is 912 pages long. Now I'm going to talk about the trilogy as a whole rather than this book on its own because it is the final book in the trilogy. Um, but I feel like I haven't done a lot of gushing about Hilary Mandel recently and so I'm straying too far away from my brand and I needed to mention it. The Wolf Hall trilogy is my favourite trilogy. Um, if you've been watching my videos since last year when I read um, Bring Up the Bodies and the Mirror and the Light back to back in March and April then I then you will know that how much I fell in love with this book. It tells the story of Thomas Cromwell. Wolf Hall starts with his childhood as a poor boy in Putney and leads up to the death of Thomas More and the breaking of the church with um, Henry marrying Anne Boleyn. The second book is much shorter and follows on directly from that until the death of Anne Boleyn and in the third book we are building up to the beheading of Thomas Cromwell. I don't think that any of these are spoilers because it is actual history that happened 450 years ago so I'm counter spoilers and one of the things that Hilary Mantel is so good at is even though 
you can go into it knowing quite a lot about it and knowing who is going to die. She still manages to build tension and a desire for that not to happen, um, particularly to Crum in the third book. Crum is a nickname for Cromwell, um, but also for all of the other characters. She manages to build so much tension despite the fact that you know, and in fact uses the fact that you know to build dramatic irony into things that characters say to one another and for you to be able to see where characters are slipping up and where they are making mistakes. The best thing about these novels are the atmosphere, uh, the way that Mantel builds the Tudor court around you. It all feels so very real and so like you are reading by candlelight. It is also written directly in, it is not written in the first person, but it is written as if you are right next to Thomas Cromwell. We always know what he is thinking and it is written almost as a stream of consciousness in some ways. The idea of memory and of ghosts are very important themes in these novels and you go you follow along with Cromwell what he is thinking when he is in the middle of a memory. He will suddenly be interrupted in the present time and we will move the plot forwards and then he will go back to the memory. Um, and those two points will play off one against one, one another and new points of his memory will come to light because of what's happening in the present day. It feels like such a great psychological perspective of one person and he feels such a fully fleshed real character. Um, I do have a video that is reviewing this trilogy all on its own if you would like to watch me talk about it for 12 straight minutes but if you haven't read it yet if I haven't yet persuaded you to I really think you should try it out. I know it's not for everyone but I do think that it is absolutely brilliant. And then the final book that I'm going to talk about, the longest book on this list, is David Copperfield by Charles Dickens which in some editions is 1024 pages long. I had read some Dickens before and I didn't really get on with it. I didn't think that Dickens was my thing. But the way that I read David Copperfield, it took me over a year to read. I don't think you necessarily need that long, but, da but Charles Dickens wrote in instalments. He wrote that were published weekly in a newspaper. And I think that spreading him out, spreading his books out over time is uh, works really well because Dickens deals a lot with repetition and with stock characters and I think that when you read them all back up against one another it can become tedious but when it's stretched out it feels more like a inside joke than like a repetition. David Copperfield tells the story of one little boy from his birth, uh, literally his birth is the beginning of the book, uh, right through different trials in his life. He is born just after his father dies, so he never knows him, and he grows up in a genteel family. But when his mother remarries, he is sent to a brutal school, and then when she dies, he is sent to work as a child. We follow his escape from that to meet um, his aunt and his rise again up into um, being a working young man in a profession um, and the fall again and rise again. So there is a lot of different parts of Victorian society that are explored through this one character. It is definitely a comedy. There are lots of comedic characters, uh, stock characters, as I said at the beginning, that are used for comic effect. There's a lot to laugh at. Um, Dickens draws these characters really, really well. But they are definitely caricatures rather than like fully fleshed out characters, but they are skillful caricatures nonetheless. There are lots of different episodes, lots of different divergences, but I feel like the through plot is enough to carry you through because it is the story of this one boy's life. It deals with sort of found family and building your own family and deals a lot with familial love, which I think uh, brings a lot of warmth to the novel. Um, it also deals with dark aspects of Victorian society and again with cycles of poverty and how people can be trapped in that poverty. David Copperfield is based on Dickens himself. It's not like a laissez-faire bootstraps kind of book. Um, it's very much a book about community and working together and also about how and keep you trapped, particularly for women. There is a lot of aspects of this that talk about women's poverty and the um, ease of straying as a woman from what is deemed like polite society and how uh, that blame is put on you. Um, it is a book that talks about the unfairness of Victorian society a lot. Um, it's not a classic that I ever thought I would like really but I am really glad that I tried it. I found there was a lot in it to endear me to it. So those are my 10 favourite big books that I've ever read. I'm not a huge reader of big books. Most books that I read are between 250 and 350 pages um, so if you have any big book recommendations for me please let me know in the comments down below I would love to know what your favorite long books are thank you for watching if you did enjoy this video I will put another one here that I think you will like and I will also put a button here for you to subscribe if you haven't already I put out new videos every Thursday and Sunday so I will see you again very soon 
Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.